first time, you'll know that at most seminars, you can ask any questions, it's always, always very quiet. <laughs> yeah, so I'm glad there's a lot of, uh, you know, questions and answers and interaction amongst, from the audience. And for the next speaker, yeah, we have Mark, who will talk about, uh, who's actually from California, and he'll be sharing something about this sneaker net thing, which some of us may not be very familiar. Right. right. So I'll hand over the stage to Mark. Yeah, hi. Um, so I, I'm i here presenting at SB7 um, about this thing called the Bionet that I've been working on, but I just wanted to quickly go through where I'm coming from and wh how I ended up here, because I think I had a lot of trouble getting to the point that I am right now, and I feel like a lot of people might have the same problem. So when I was a teenager, I discovered open source. I read this book, and I realized that this wasn't just like cool code to play with, but it was more like a small revolution happening. So I was playing around with Linux, and I got excited about that there's a whole community around open source. But it was, it was early days, and I couldn't find any real community. I was in a small town. I couldn't find any community around what, uh, working on open things. Um, so when I got to university, there was a Linux user group, and I joined this. But you know, it's just in the end, it was just like five, ten people sitting in a room, staring at each other, and playing with with uh, source code. And we had trouble getting the community moved beyond just that. So um, okay, this is kind of a dark image, but this is kind of a dusk image of uh, Chaos Communications Camp. And um, for those of you who don't know about Chaos Communication Camp, there's a, a Chaos Computer Club in Berlin. It's existed since I think '87 um, as a hacker activist group um, and a hacker space, a C base uh, in Berlin. Uh, probably the first real hacker space in the world. Um, they put this on every four years, and the uh, next one is in two years. As, so it's basically an old Russian air base that's now an air museum. So all the planes are there, and all the old hangars are there. And uh, you just come there, like 3,000 hackers, and hang out and camp in tents, and then you have a week-long conference, and it's awesome. It's like a hacker city. Uh, it's like Hacker Burning Man. Uh, and everyone comes there, and they're like, should we just stay? Could we just stay here and have a hacker city and live in a hacker city? Uh, so I was very inspired by this. And the 2007 one happened to be the, to be the one where the people who started via the MetaLab hackerspace in Vienna, they, uh, they showed up and they said, here's how you start a hackerspace. We just did it. And they did it very easily because they uh, got all the people from Germany who already had a hackerspace uh, to come and, and then donate all the stuff they needed the day they opened the door, the day they got the key. They just, there's a whole cadre of hackers standing there with computers and networking gear. And, and, and so, so, but they were like, here's the blueprints. Here's how you start a hackerspace. So everyone was like, oh, we should, everyone who came to this went home thinking we should start a hackerspace. And a lot of people did. Um, that was the 2007. Uh, it was just a one of the cool photos where they lit up the jets with LEDs so they look like they're burning fuel. And, uh, okay, so MetaLab in Vienna, which I just had the opportunity to visit last week for the first time, so that was really good to see. Um, so then uh, at the, every year they have this conference, which is just a normal conference in a conference hall uh, in Berlin or Hamburg. Um, it's the Chaos Communication Congress. Um, there's this guy talking. I wasn't there, but I was live streaming it. And I saw this talk by this guy I didn't know about called Drew Endy, and he was talking about programming DNA. And I was like, what's this guy doing at a hacker conference talking about biology? And, and he made it sound like you can just program DNA, program life the way that you program computers. So I thought, ah, oh, I want to get into this. How do I get into this? I had an email. I said, ha, ah, Drew, how do I get into synthetic biology? I'm an IT person. And I'm in Denmark. And he said, ah, oh, maybe you could try, you know, getting a job in a bioinformatics department, and then uh, like slowly move edging into the lab. So I tried that, and you know, I learned some stuff, but they didn't let me into the lab. <laughs> so, so I was like, ah, how do I get into a lab? I want to try this stuff. Uh, I was in Copenhagen. There's a lot of restrictions in the European Union on genetic engineering. Um, in the meantime, however, we finally started our hackerspace in Copenhagen in 2009. So at least we had that. We had a decent-sized hackerspace. Um, and we had a community around us. Finally, we had some community around openness in uh, Denmark. Um, I did that. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. Yeah. And uh, so then we tried to start. Uh, I was like, well, if I can't have a, if I can't get into a lab, maybe we will just start a lab. So we tried starting a DIY biospace or a biohacker space in Copenhagen. Um, ran into a lot of issues because of the regulations. We tried to talk to the people who were actually certifying things for biosafety level one. Um, they wouldn't talk to us because there's rules about that they can't really hold your hand. They can just come in and look and certify good or not good. Um, 
it's one of those things where they have this separation of powers. So you basically have to hire someone who has already done it to go through it. It's a very complicated process. So we, we just had to work with stuff that was legal. So you can do genetic engineering in the European Union without certification, but you can only move things around within the same uh, realm of life, basically, the same species. Um, so it's not very interesting. But you can do stuff like, you know, you can run 16S RNA, just do species identification, stuff like that. Um, I, okay, so skipping ahead. So I gave up, basically, and I just took the easy route. In Denmark, edu education is free, so I just was like, well, fuck it, I'm going to go get a master's degree from the university that has a lab, and I'm just going to fill my course schedule with lab courses. And I did that, and I uh, cheated, and I got uh, lab experience. And then I was like, oh, okay, I need to do a master's project. Hey, Drew, who I haven't contacted since my initial email a few years ago, uh, can I come work in your lab? And he was like, yeah, sure. And so I, so I went to uh, Stanford, or actually at that point I went to uh, J Bay um, in uh, Emeryville and I worked with Adam Arkin and Drew Endy and it was a great opportunity and to work with the team there. So I recommend this, if you have this opportunity to have it like a bachelor's project or a master's project, you can use that to get into places by saying, hey, I have free labor. <laughs> I, you you want to choose your own project, but if you, if, you wanna, if you give that up and say like, you. You tell me what to, what you need to work on, you can get into a lot of places. So that's that's what happened there. Then while I was working on that, um, I met someone who was trying to start a hackerspace in, in Oakland, and they already had a name for it. So we uh, started meeting around uh, this place called Sudaroom that Jenny mentioned before. Um, so, so we managed to start a new hackerspace, and it kind of came out of the Occupy Oakland movement. So it's much more radical and much more organized around um, you know hacktivism and, and and activism in general. Okay, skipping ahead a little bit. Well, we were starting to, once we were starting this hackerspace, there's already another hackerspace, there other hackerspaces in the area, and one of them was uh, BioCurious. Uh, turned out a lot of people at BioCurious, they, um, and you know, if you don't know about BioCurious, it's, hacker, it's the oldest hackerspace, uh, biohackerspace in the US, I believe, or maybe around the oldest, one of the first. And uh, it was it is in the South Bay, and a lot of people were commuting from Oakland or the East Bay about an hour, an hour and a half to go there. And it turns out a lot of the core organizers weren't living where the space was, so they were like, "We should start our own space." And they were showing up at Sudo Room, and so we thought, "Well, maybe we can start it out of Sudo Room, or maybe we can take Sudo Room and, and Counterculture Labs, which was the name of this new hacker, uh, biohacker space, and maybe uh, some of the other groups that do radical organizing and get together and get a bigger place, and because uh, rent is expensive." So uh, while we were doing that, we started some projects to just start working and stuff. So this is actually like the back room of someone's house where we just like, what? I always share this when I give uh, DIY talks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is, uh, this is by the, so one of the people in the group, they had this uh, guest room basically that was unused and we set up with the first bio lab there. This is the US, so you can do this. <laughs> you don't have to get sort of. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll play the video while I'm talking, I guess. If there's a... Oh, I don't have internet, sorry. Uh, offline copy? Uh, here we go, I have it here. Offline copy. So it's kind of, there's a voiceover, but never mind. So this this project, we can't, we, we were trying to find a project to kick off our biohacker space, and we thought, it's okay, I'll just talk. And we thought, well, what if I start, uh, what we to do... Uh, something that is related to it, something everyone cares about, or like food. So we thought, what's something that's low-hanging fruit, like a uh, you know, first-generation genetic engineering project, where we just have to make a protein, not like a whole pathway, and uh, it's something everyone cares about. And so we said, oh, what, what if we just make cheese protein? And uh, we just take, and this is actually a collaboration between BioCurious and the now almost existing counterculture labs. Um, so if we take cheese protein, the cheese protein uh, genes, there's like three important ones, stick them into yeast and then just purify the, the protein and then we can just add the other parts of, of milk that go into cheese which is like fat and water <laughs> and uh, sugar, lactose. And maybe we can make a cheese. Uh, so we put a made in Indiegogo campaign, we got about uh, $37,000 because people got excited about this project. We hadn't aimed, I think we aimed at 10k or something. Uh, so overwhelming response, a lot of media attention, um, and then um, a lot of people who were like, "When can we have this cheese?" <laughs> Where does it stand? What? Where does this project stand? Yeah. So this project, um, 
we've got to the point where we got like small amounts of expression of the proteins we're interested in. Um, the most difficult one was kappa casein. Um, kappa casein is kind of the magic of cheese. Uh, actually, the magic of milk. So, um, brief detour, I guess. But the way milk works is that what milk is evolutionarily, what this purpose is, is it's a delivery mechanism for uh, high concentrations of protein through a fluid me medium from a mother to uh, offspring. And uh, Protein's difficult because protein is generally hard to dissolve in water in high quantities. So kappa casein acts kind of like soap acts for oil and water, but b between proteins and water. It's a hydrophobic and hydrophilic protein on different, different ends, and it creates these little micelles, these little spheres, where all the hydrophobic ends are pointing inwards and the hydrophilic ends are pointing outwards, and it's like a ball of protein. So once you have uh, kappa casein, you can dissolve huge amounts of protein in a liquid, and then you can, um, and that's milk, well, with some other stuff. And then once you have it in the liquid form with a bunch of fats floating around as well, and sugars, if you suddenly cleave all, off all the ends that are sticking out, all the hydrophilic ends of that protein, then it rapidly drops out of solution, really rapidly. And in fact, all those fats and sugars and, and a lot of the water gets trapped in a protein matrix, which is what's basically cheese. Then the only thing remaining is to squeeze it, salt it, and age it. So if you can make kappa casein, the, the theory is you can make cheese. Um, so like I said, we only made minute amounts of this stuff, and uh, our biggest, uh, we still have a lot of money in the bank account, because we decided we're only going to use the money to buy lab equipment, uh, and we're only going to buy it used, and, we only, and uh, reagents. And we're not going to pay anyone, because it's not enough money to pay someone to work on it. Protein purification. Um, so because it's so small amounts, we've only done gels. Uh, we only ran gels for the protein pur uh, purification. So, of course, oh, we ran some immunoassays, so we managed to get some um, yeah, um, antibodies for some of these things, because they're so well known from the dairy industry. They've been analyzed a lot, so you can get uh, antibodies for them. Um, the, what we just did is we applied for uh, funding from New Harvests, which is a group that supports these uh, new style um, engineered foods uh, and vegan replacements and uh, they actually came to us so we have I think we have a good chance of getting funding for them and if we get this funding we'll probably hear back next month um, we should we have enough for two people to work uh, half time each uh, eight months and that should be enough to get us to like small scale proof of concept which hopefully will get us enough attention from funders that uh, the people who in the group who are interested in doing a commercial product can do that though of course everything that we develop is on our wiki, open source, freely available for everyone. What about uh, Clara Foods Perfect Day? Oh yeah, uh, our uh, evil nemesis. Uh, Is there your evil nemesis? Yeah. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure. No, they, uh, they're stealth mode, so they don't talk to us. Uh, so there's another different group that uh, they start out being called Mufri. And they are uh, doing almost the same thing that they're focusing on milk, which is slightly more complicated in some ways, le less complicated in other ways. You don't have to get the kappa casein mi and the micellular structure right, but you have to make more different proteins. Um, and they, they've been going for almost as long as we have. I think they started like six months or something after we started. Um, in the beginning, they weren't sharing. We talked to them and they were like, yeah, we can share. We'll, you know, we can talk and we'll share our info. And then they stopped talking to everyone, including the media. And we actually got uh, pissed off journalists calling us like complaining about them because they, they wouldn't even talk to them about the stuff that had already been made public earlier. So I think that happened when they got investors involved and the investors were like, you have, to, you have to be secret. And then we haven't heard anything since then. It's like two years ago. <laughs> so we don't know what's going on. I think they have a product schedule later this year, right? If they keep saying that. So. Ah, okay. Yeah. I think it keeps getting pushed. Oh. <laughs> uh, anyway, let's see. Well, uh, sorry. Uh, okay. So I was talking about how we wanted to get all go in on a big space. So we actually did that. Um, a bunch of different groups that we uh, knew and a bunch of different people who had ideas for groups they wanted to start all went together and said, OK, let's find a space. And then we found this awesome space. It was a 20,000 square foot. It was about 2,000 square meter space in, um, in this like uh, north neighborhood of, of Oakland. It's an old uh, Italian space that was actually built as a community space, as like an uh, Italian social club. Um, and there, it was just being used by these two old, older people who were living there, as <laughs> using it as their home. 
So they decide they after much negotiation and lots of running around and finding enough groups that we can actually afford the space. Uh, one of our friends doing most of the work of uh, negotiating with these people, they agreed to a three-year lease with an option to buy with a lower than market rate price to buy, and uh, we rented for two years. Um, and uh, we moved in the we started the hackerspace and the bio hackerspace in the same big room in the back up next against each other and uh, a big beautiful ball oh, actually yeah I should play the video by it. Thank you. Uh, here we go. So we also did crowdfunding campaign for that, and we did, we had one of the collectives happened to be a uh, you know a radical documentary filmmaking collective. So of course they did our video, it's and all one shot. yeah, it's a one shot video tour of the entire thing. Um, and uh, after two years and a lot of effort by a lot of people, especially Jenny over there, <laughs> uh, we managed to buy it a few months ago. Uh, we got a one million dollar anonymous donation that helped quite a bit. You said not. You said not. Yeah. It's a. Uh, it's on Shattuck Avenue, uh, up north uh, in Temescal. So this is like, as you can see, we just moved in, and I was like, we just put up stuff to make it look sciencey for the video. We didn't actually have anything yet. <laughs> uh, and uh, here, here's the normal, the, here's the room, the normal hacker space. Uh, it was a little more established at that point, so we actually had some some real stuff going on, um, including the uh, repurposed, reprogrammed robot arm pouring tea, as you can see here. <laughs> so that's an old industrial welding robot. <laughs> Uh, and then, uh, as you can see, a lot of antennas here because one of the projects we have out there is a community mesh networking project because we're really pissed off at Comcast and AT and T, so we're trying to replace them uh, with a community network. And lots of space. Like uh, there, this printing press collective is one of the few uh, collectives that well, not few actually, quite a few of the collectives that didn't exist before the Omni ended up not lasting, and people try to start things and they they fail. So that put us in a bit of a crisis situation with Gods to Rent, but. A lot of uh, people in our community came together and just lent us money, uh, kept piling money into the black hole until we could buy it. Okay, uh, I'll skip. Um, so we have about ten mem member collectives right now. Ten. Yeah. So. Ten member collectives, uh, which have varying degrees of participation. So, like one of them is Two Dot Bombs, uh, which uh, distributes free food. To is all volunteer uh, seven days a week, and that membership is like pretty ambiguous. It's, it's like probably like 200 people who occasionally volunteer, maybe 20 who are like super regular. You know, the student room is kind of similar. Like, we technically have like 100 maybe members, but only like 15, 20 people who are there regularly. Yeah. And they all th these collectives are all very different. So there's the hackerspace that has traditional membership stru structure, but is open to the public. And then there's stuff like Food Not Bombs, which um, they exist solely to pick up uh, excess foods from grocery stores and restaurants, and then uh, give them to the to people who don't have cook. cook them into meals, and then serve meals six days a week to anyone who wants them on the street. And they, they they're trying to renovate the kitchen, the old industrial kitchen in the basement. And then there's like a ton of different like. Okay, I'm skipping in. generally public theater, things that are more low cost or non profit oriented, who rent the space on a sliding scale basis. So maybe we'll split like a share of the door, or maybe we'll ask for like $200 for the evening, or if they're actually charging at the door and making some money, then we'll ask for like the standard, which is like $400, for the ballroom. Okay. For meeting spaces, it's much cheaper. We should, we should move on. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we develop. We also developed some software out of these things, uh, out of these uh, collectives. So I just wanted to mention a couple of them if people are interested. Uh, Dumpscribe uh, is uh, a piece of software that we did made that uh, takes the smart pens, the live scribe. It supports everything except the newest uh, wireless version. And basically, you run this piece of software uh, on, on a computer in, in like a like little Raspberry Pi, hook it up to the thing, and then you check your lab notes with the normal, with as writing them normally in your book, but on the special paper. And when you dock it back, they instantly go online, uh, get converted to open formats like PDF and Augvorbis for the audio, and just instantly go to your website. So this helps when people want to see like what, what did people do on this community project yesterday. Just like everyone takes lab notes, and they're instantly available online. Uh, 
Uh, we also have Gogo Labeler because when we created our, um, you know, all these crowdfunding campaigns, suddenly we have to send people T-shirts and all this shit, and it's really difficult. And so we created this thing that prints uh, prepaid shipping labels and like normal address labels from the CSV dumps from the from Kickstarter and on Indiegogo. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned, we're also doing a community uh, mesh network. It's one of the more active projects. It's not really open science, but you know. If you want to do open science, you need infrastructure. One of them is communication. And if we don't own our own communication networks, then people can censor what we do. So um, long distance Wi-Fi links from rooftop to rooftop using mesh networking protocols, a firmware that we developed based on OpenWRT, allows people to communicate uh, directly and without relying on the internet. <coughs> And uh, this is another one we're doing, the Sasser Radio, which I was, uh, was the reason I was in Vienna presenting about. It's a very, very low bandwidth, but much easier to deploy and completely off-grid based on solar power network that we uh, just had the first prototype, we've just finished the first prototype on. Uh, it's only like a few kilobits per second, but that's enough for chat and things like that. Okay, so right now I work for BioBricks Foundation because I ran out of money, so I had to get a job um, after three years of just doing all these volunteer projects. Um, so Bybrix Foundation, for those who know, don't know about it, is it's a little bit like the Free Software Foundation for software, if you're a software person. Um, they support, uh, they create supporting technologies, uh, both legal technologies and wetware and software and hardware for um, promoting openness and, uh, and, and just improving the situation within synthetic biology. Um, so we're here presenting this, mo this project called the Bionet at SB7. Um, and the Bionet is a decentralized wetware sneaker net. It's kind of like the internet for, th for stuff. So the internet is cool, but you can only transfer information. And a lot of people are like, well, you can just transfer the, the DNA sequences and then s synthesize them. But first of all, not everything's just sequences. A lot, a lot of stuff is actually like other kinds of samples. And you can't really synthesize a full organism quite yet. It'll take a while before we get there, especially for some organisms. And a lot of people can't really afford to synthesize everything every time they need something. So we're trying to make, make a way for people to share their biological information really easily. And, and for that, we created the Bionet. And the Bionet is multiple different things. It's both wetware, software, and hardware. Um, let me just put, pull up a video while I'm talking here. Um, so this is, uh, well, wait, this is a little too big, isn't it? Yeah, now we can see it. Okay, so this is the Bionet software. It's basically just uh, an open source web-based inventory system written in Node.js. And as you can see, it has uh, nice 3D visualizations for your um, lab inventory. So you can put stuff into it and tell it where stuff is. And then when you scan barcodes on it, it'll like open up like this and show you, oh, it's in this box and this rack and this freezer. Um, and the idea is we give people a free and open source, really nice inventory management system People use it in labs because everyone's lab management, unless they have like the expensive Thermo Fisher solution or something, is shit. Um, and then people are happy and they use it. And then there's a little button on every single thing you add to the system that says, make it open, make it available to the world. So this, this is not just one web app running on one web server where you go and use it on our server. It's the thing that you install on your own web server. And then there's multiple installations and you can use your own domain. Uh, and it's all you can keep your data private. You can keep it you know, on your own computer in your space if you want. Uh, but then as soon as you click make public, what happens is that all of the nodes they find each other. They actually it's actually on the back end using the BitTorrent DHT. So it uses uh, peer to peer technologies to discover and connect all the nodes together. And then it, when you search, it the search travels across the entire Bionet and gives you the results back. Um, and right now we just have plain text search. We just basically launched it today. Um, and it's very alpha level software, but I think in like a month we'll have the, the blast search ready as well, and the elastic search, so we'll be more able to do more like human language stuff that corrects the spelling mistakes and, and do real blast searches across the entire, uh, all the sequences of Bionet. We support FASTA, FASTQ, uh, GenBank, and SBO out of the box. Um, but of course you can always add more formats because it's open source. Um, we also support these, I don't have any, I didn't bring the printer because there's I wouldn't want to lug it along. But basically, we have these scanners and printers, especially off-the-shelf stuff that we just hook up to a little uh, Raspberry Pi running our software that cloud enables these USB things. So you get a little cheap label printer, a USB label printer. And then from, it's like a $60 thing from Brother. And then you get the special label pa paper that can hold up to minus 80. It's not very expensive. And then um, you load our software onto the Raspberry Pi. It automatically connects to your node. And then when people hit print, 
in the web app, it sends it to the Raspberry Pi, sends it to the printer and prints it. And we have the same thing with a little a scanner unit, also hooked up to Raspberry Pi. And then we have, we're developing a system with, where you use these little Bluetooth low energy tags. Let's see if I have one. They're like $6. You've probably seen them to help you find your keys. Um, and um, so it basically, when in a lab, it's usually a fairly secure environment. So logging in doesn't have to be like username and password and two-factor authentication. So basically, the Raspberry Pi is just detect when, when you're near. So you associate this with your user account. And, and then when you walk over to the scanner and scan something, if you have it pulled up on your phone or your laptop anywhere, you have it pulled up under your user account, it shows what you scanned. And if you print something, it doesn't print until you walk over to the printer and then spits it out when it detects your proximity. Um, and that's easy to do because the Raspberry Pi has built-in Bluetooth, and these things are cheap. Ah, another thing that happened today is that we uh, announced uh, this partnership with the Pix Foundation and Twist, which I thought you might find interesting. We were, we were basically buying about 10 megabases of synthesis from Twist, and we, ma and we managed to convince Twist somehow. I was not part of this. Um, so mo for those of you who don't know, most synthesis companies, almost all of them, um, when you buy stuff or see DNA from them, they actually release it under uh, these terms that don't allow you to share it with anyone else. Most people don't know this because they never read the terms. Um, but it was hard to find a company that's willing to make this stuff open. So another thing that was released that is not fi quite public yet because there's a comment period. There's like a request for comments for 60 days right now on the open MTA. So if you've ever dealt with material transfer agreements, you've probably dealt with the UBMTA, which is what all academic institutions use, almost all, to transfer materials between each other. And the UBMTA is like a contract that you sign in order to get something from someone else, saying that you only use it for academic purposes, you won't use it for uh, commercial purposes, and you won't uh, pass it on to anyone else outside of your lab. That's really limiting. And uh, if you get something from AdGene, it's under UBMTA. Uh, so then there's always a way around it, which is to resynthesize it. If it's a piece of DNA, that can be expensive. Sometimes it's difficult if it's a special piece of DNA. Uh, or if it's an organism, you can't do it. So we released the open MTA, which is basically like um, uh, MIT-style license. It's like you can do whatever you want. But it makes all the lawyers happy at the universities. So our, our lawyers have been going around um, signing people up, uh, signing universities up for this at the institutional level so that the academics can share in a way that can be reshared. These 10,000, uh, these 10 megabases, 10,000 genes, I don't know why they say 10,000 genes, these 10 megabases will be uh, decided by the community and we'll probably just put up like a subreddit and people can like post, I want this gene, and then upvote and downvote, and then the top genes will synthesize and release under the OpenMTA and then send them to the people. And the only thing you have to do is you have to guarantee or you have to promise that you're going to reshare them with someone else. So if you have ordered something and a lot of people wanted it, then you have to be responsible for sending some out to other people. Yes. Yes, as long as especially anyone who has a minus eighty freezer. Uh, yeah, okay, I think I'm going way over time. But I wanted to mention two two little projects I'm working on. Um, so this is uh, a little PCB, maybe you can pass it around. Uh, and it's just a funny little idea I had, but I'd like to get more people working on it. It's a, um, the idea was, the, what's the minimal, uh, what's the cheapest bioreactor uh, you can make? And I so thought, well, the two most important things a bioreactor have to do, has to do is maintain temperature and uh, have a, light, a magnet you can spin or not spin um, to stir it. So I thought, can you do that on a piece of PCB? Uh, so we tried to make this prototype PCB that, um, has many magnetic coils built into it that can both be heating and uh, generating the rotating magnetic field. And this is the first test, and it definitely heats, which is easy. Uh, and it, but it, if the glass is just a little too thick, it uh, it can't spin the magnet that well. Um, so we need to upgrade our PC, our, our fab process to get a 12 ounce instead of this is four ounce copper, which is double the normal amount of copper. But if we get to 12 ounce, I think it'll work. And uh, Maybe we could get these made uh, for like five bucks a pop, plus maybe five bucks for the electronics, and then a little Erlenmeyer flask, and then maybe we can say we can sell them as little kits for people to play with in schools and stuff, and maybe they can be upgraded. Uh, and then another thing that we're working on is a um, uh, it's a minus a personal minus eighty freezer, because uh, we realized this is a huge problem for a lot of labs that they're that's like the limiting thing that makes a lot of things impossible for them. It's no minus eighty. 
Um, we have a minus 80, we just got it, we're very excited about it, but even if you can get one for free, the amount of power that it takes is just really expensive. So we, we took this um, little, uh, what do you call it, like a thermos, you can get uh, these thermoses with vacuum inside, they're very cheap, but you can get ones that are really big and wide, and then we just added a ton of more insulation around it, and uh, basically it made, uh, you know how heat incubators, they, a lot of them they have uh, water jackets on the outside, like a basically a layer, a thick layer of water on the outside to stabilize the temperature. Well, this has a, uh, the opposite. It has a, a glycerol layer on the inside to stabilize the negative temperature. So if you mix a third glycerol, two thirds water, the uh, mental melting temperature is minus 45 centigrade. So that means if you get it below minus 45 centigrade, when you open it, even though it's a tiny compartment that wants to heat up really quickly, you have this water jacket where the temperature runs up from minus 80 to minus 45 and it stops until all the glycerol water solution is melted. So it's like a huge buffer which also means you could probably transport it. And then we stick the whole thing in a bucket full of in, even more insulation, and then the cooling comes from a chunk of aluminum that's running through the glycerol that's connected to a bunch of uh, stacks of Peltier units, uh, like three levels deep, with a, a, a really beefy CPU power, and then a couple of um, really beefy uh, coolers, like CPU coolers, fans with, uh, well, and uh, they're, we're, we've only gotten it down to minus 35 right now, so we need to add more Peltier's. That was with six, uh, what is it, 15 amp Peltier's at 12 volts. Um, but we're hoping to, to try to make this something that anyone can build so they can at least have a tiny amount of minus 80 in there. What, what weight? What? Total, total weight do you anticipate? Weight for the unit? Excluding power. I don't know, probably like six kilograms or something. Yeah. Okay, it's very small. It's like, I haven't actually measured it, but it's like this this much diameter. <laughs> and then it's like uh, 10 centimeters deep. What? <laughs> no, we're, we're gonna have to 3D, we're gonna have to laser cut some little holders for the tubes that fit inside of it. You could probably have like two levels of tubes and maybe, uh, maybe you could have a like, 60, 70 tubes or something, I think you could fit in there. Did it actually hold minus 80? No, I've only gotten it down to minus 35 so far, but I ran out of... Hmm? That's usable. That's usable. Yeah. 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 Uh, and uh, it, run us, it runs on 12 volts, so the hope is that you can toggle it into travel mode, and then um, plug it into your car cigarette lighter plug, and then just main not open it, and maintain temperature while you're driving. Um, but we don't know if that is, is going to be viable with the amount of power consumption, so we'll see. I wish I had a picture of it, but I was forgot to take one before I left. In in a what thermos? In the thermos. Just a the thermos, yeah. yeah just a How long does that last? How do you yeah. how do you prevent it from exploding with the dry ice? You just you don't seal it. I, I don't seal it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I found the previous styrofoam boxes with dry ice. Yeah. 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 The thing is, uh, you know, uh, some places like for example in Denmark, uh, you can't buy dry ice without a license. <laughs> <laughs> Well, actually, I was also looking at a like portable, light, cheap uh, storage like to keep things cool. And uh, my friends in the food business, and they have this packaging which is like I think it's wool, but they make these boxes, so it's, it's like you go find it. But it's, in fact, it's just wool, and it apparently can stay at like a really low temperature for okay. shipping for a long time. So cool. Yeah, and it's light, I guess. Okay. Well, I, I don't have any more. I thought it, it took so long. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>